Well, the Lord is good. It's good to be here today with everyone here this morning. It's good to laugh, good to smile, uh, good to um, move forward in Jesus. We are, uh, uh, this is our week five of our Judges series. So we have this week, next week, and then the final week will be the week of baptisms. Um, that'll be our final week of, uh, of the book of Judges. So today and next week, I'm going to be talking about one of the most amazing judges, I think, uh, that we can look at, the man by the name of Samson. And uh, really, really excited to look at Samson over the next uh, two weeks. And there's a lot of different things we could go at uh, looking at Samson's life. Uh, one of the things I really want to gear into and look into and really dive into is how Samson's birth, his life, and ultimately his death point the way to Jesus. It is an absolute story. If we read through it, we're going to look through today his birth, and we're going to look a little bit into his life today. But we're going to look about how his life, even biblically, scripturally, it is pointing the way to Jesus. Even as we look, there's language borrowed from the New Testament story of, of Jesus that are even we even see in the life of Samson. It's no accident that these, that these are so similar. Why? Because ultimately, as that slide shows, the people need a savior, and every person that's being lifted up here to, uh, to show uh, the way is showing the way to Jesus. So if you have your Bibles today, open them to Judges chapter 13, and by the grace of God, I will be able to move through this message and encourage you in the things of the Lord here. Judges chapter 13, we're going to read through, and I'll just bring some, I'll comment a little bit as we read, and, uh, and then we'll end with some applications uh, for us, what the what this scripture could mean and mean to my life today, and impart to my life today. Let's pray, fathers. We open up your word this morning. I pray that you'd speak to us, speak to me, speak to the body today. Feed us, Lord. I I really just felt this morning, Lord, heard from you that you you're calling us to as a body, Lord, not to keep the short the sword in its sheath but to pull the sword out and use it, Lord, against the, the forces of darkness, Lord. And we pray today, Lord, that the word of God would be living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the very heart of the matter in each of our lives. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Judges chapter 13, verse 1 says, starts here. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Years. Kind of a familiar passage in the sense of we've read this before in the book of Judges. The people again did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's interesting here where we even see, and they were, they were uh, under the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Somebody had said to me last week, they said, isn't it interesting? You keep seeing like 40 years uh, throughout the, uh, the word. And the, and, and, the, and, the, and the interesting perspective is it represents a generation. Thanks, honey. Thank you. I let everybody know that you beat me in the potato race last night. <laughs> and that I hurt my nose. But other than that, we're good. Um, the, uh, thank you. Wow, that's really good. All right. 40 years. The years of a generation. That, 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 that there's cycles. And we even experience this where we could look through. Right now, this church is even over. What, are, what is this church? What year? I know we're 45 years, 46 years. Anybody know that number off the top of their head? Larry, number, number year 40. 75, that's 46 years. That's probably about right, right where it is because, Larry, I know you've been here uh, from near the genesis of the church and the planting. So, But the, the church has been through a generation. Larry, if you could sit here, you've been here since 75. You've seen people come and go, right? Come and go to the, to the far corners of the world, uh, being used by the, for the things of God. It's part of the generational move. But even in the midst of the generational impact that we have as a local body, we can always fall prey, anyone can fall prey to the drift that can come generationally. And, uh, you know, I, I say this a lot, it's very, very important. There's no such thing as, you know, as second generation Christians. Do you understand? There's no such thing, you know, there's no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There's just children. There's just people that have been set free by the grace of God and the goodness of God. And we pray, and every one of us that, has, that, have, that have children, we all pray for our children. Go, oh God, that they may know you. Just because uh, children are born into your Christian family and your, and your Christian worldview and the kingdom of God is active in your family doesn't mean they're saved, right? They need an encounter with God. They need for themselves to cry out to God on their own. So here we have another generation that's drifted away. What's interesting about this generation that we see in 
Judges chapter 13, verse 1. Remember how we talked about it's a constant decline of generations and a constant decline in the drift. And we see through the book of Judges, as we get, as we get near the end of the book, it gets worse and worse. And by the end, it looks like, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah all over again in the end of the book of Judges. Well, what's interesting even here about verse 1 is, and verse 2, we don't see it. Every other time where this is discussed, the people cry out to the Lord. Every other time in Scripture where they, they, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, God handed them into the hand of the Philistines or the Ammonites or wherever, and the people began to cry out to the Lord. Guess what? There's no crying out to the Lord here. There's no crying out to God for help. That makes what we're about to see and read about even in the life of Samson, one of the most miraculous births we can see in Scripture, this miraculous moment is a gift of grace to the people. It's an absolute gift of grace that Samson, that this moment when the angel of the Lord visits Manoah's wife and begins to speak into the existence, Samson, and what God's going to do in his life, as God begins to move here, understand, it is a gift of grace that God continually leans into humanity, even when we reject him, even when we don't even cry out to him, he loves us that much. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Boy, that's grace. We see it here in the story. Even in his birth itself, it's a, it's, it echoes of a birth to come. Samson was a gift of God's grace. Jesus is the perfect gift of God's grace. Verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children. But you shall conceive and bear a son. You shall conceive and bear a son. Language so similar to language we read in the book of Matthew. Similar to Jesus' miraculous birth and even another birth at the same time that we see in the book of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And that is the birth of John the Baptist, whose mother herself was, Elizabeth, was barren without a son. And God gave her a son. You see, God's into something right here, even as we read the scripture. So the angel Lord continues to verse 4 to Manoah's wife. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Isn't that beautiful? This, this Samson is a prophetic gift. God's speaking right now to, to Manoah's wife. She is not pregnant. There's nothing there. Nothing has happened. And not only is she going to be blessed with a child that they've been praying for, but that child himself will be a child who will deliver Israel in that generation. Now the vow of a Nazarite, we can read about the, the Nazarite vow in Scripture. It's normally a voluntary vow that a person would make as they serve the Lord. They serve the Lord, they make a Nazarite vow, and they would, you know, they would not, let, uh, they would not get their hair cut, they you know, avoid a uh, certain drink. I mean, they, they were, there were things they did in that vow. But this, what we see here, is we see a man dedicated to God from the womb from his mother. We see that also. We could see that, we look in the story of Hannah. And Samuel, you know, we see a mother dedicating her son to the Lord from the womb. We see that in, in, in the story of John the Baptist, a, a life dedicated to God from the womb. Even John the Baptist filled with the Spirit of God in the womb when Mary showed up. I don't know if you remember that story. It's a beautiful story. But here we have, in the, in, 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 birthed in the womb of Manoah's wife, a Savior for a people who were not crying out. A savior for a people who were caught in their own web of sin and didn't even want a savior at that moment. We're going to read in the life of Samson, they were upset that Samson was even messing with the thing with the Philistines. That's what we see here. It's pretty like the people did not want Samson involved. Reminds me of John chapter 1 verse 11 where Jesus says, the Bible says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. It's again, it's a reflection we begin to see even in Samson's life, the echo of a greater savior that was coming to, the, coming to the planet. Reading on, then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. 
dedicated to God from the womb to his death. Again, we can look at right there a temporary life. This life is a temporary one. But understand, as we read through, when did the people experience salvation? While the judge was alive. That's what we read here. It was when the judge was alive that the people experienced salvation. But when that judge died, the grace was gone. That, that was gone. The people drifted back. They drifted back into that situation. And so here we have, you shall, he shall be a Nazarite from the day of his birth to the day of his death. Even saying, this is the moment of deliverance. But Jesus' life is not. Jesus' life, even in, his, in the promise of his birth, there was a promise of from the womb and his kingdom shall never end. Let me read here. It says, this is the word spoken to Mary. It says, behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. Listen to this. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. We know who Jesus is. We know the end of the story. We know who, you know, the whole story. Can you imagine this little teenage girl getting this word? And of his kingdom there shall be no end. He shall reign on the throne of his father David forever. i be like, I think you're thinking a little bit too much of your child, Mary. You know what I'm saying? I think you maybe are overthinking his life. I'm telling you, she would say, that is what the Lord told me over his life. And what does the Bible say? Mary began to treasure all those things in her heart and in her life. He will reign forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. We see a similarity even in the heart of this mother here over Samson and what the Lord's speaking over her life and what she's cherishing in her heart over the life of another mother in another place at another time in her heart. Verse 8, then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. I just find this whole passage kind of interesting. You know, here, here this, you know, uh, Manoah's wife gets talked to by the Lord. And she's, you know, and, his, and her husband says, Lord, I want to hear too. And he says, okay, I'll come talk to you. And he, and, and he goes and talks to his wife again. That's just what happens here. So the woman ran quickly. She told her husband, behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. So what? Manoah rises up and he goes with his wife and came to the man and said to him, are you the man who spoke to this woman? I don't know if that's a good way to talk about our wives, by the way. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm just realizing that. Calling my wife the woman. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe that'll work. Uh, anyhow, moving on. Uh, not, not, not something I need to comment on. And he said, I am. And Manoah said to him, now when your words come true, because they're still waiting for this life to even be born, they're, they're anticipating and expecting the miracle. He said this, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? What an amazing, profound statement, right? Manoah wants to raise this child for the glory of God. He, so he says, what shall be his manner of life and what is his mission? And listen to what verse 13 says. Verse 13 says, And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any, uh, anything all that I commanded her, let her observe. If you remember when the angel of the Lord came to, uh, came to I was going to say Mary, came to Samson's mother. When the angel of the Lord came, he said, you must not touch strong drink. You must not do thus and such. And then you dedicate your child to the Lord. So Manoah comes and says, okay, what shall this child do? How shall be his manner of life? What shall we do with the child? And what does the angel of the Lord do? He doesn't give them a strategy on Samson. He gives them a strategy of them, of Mary, of Mary, of Samson's, of Samson's mother. He gives, a, he gives a statement on them, what you are to do. You see, the thing is, I want to say to you, be careful, all of us, to pursue your mission for the Lord. Samson's mother had a mission, and the angel of the Lord told, told that to, to her, and then he revisited and he told that to Manoah. Make sure she pursues the plan of God. Because I think we can get caught up sometimes, even as, even as parents, where we, 
want to pursue their mission. We can live, I've seen this happen where we vicariously live through the mission of the next generation and we miss the opportunity for us just to continue to pursue our mission. What God's calling us to, it doesn't mean that there's not a mission for them and we're not called to raise them. Samson certainly had a mission. But the idea is here is, you, as for you, you serve the Lord. That's what you're called to do, Manoah's wife, who, by the way, is never named in Scripture. That's why it's hard. I just, we should name her name. Hmm. I was gonna, okay, what was the name we learned today? Aletha means truth, right? Uh, Aletha. We won't name her. I'm sorry, I won't do that. Okay, uh, anyways, uh, Samson's mom. What's it, Edna? <laughs> Edna. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Scott. Uh, the, uh, there's one Edna. She came to visit today. And she's like, oh, he's making fun of my name. Uh, that's not nice. Uh, anyways, she's called to pursue the things of God. She's called to run after, run after the Lord here. I just... I, I don't want us to get caught up with, with somebody else's call and miss what God has for us. I've seen people go off track trying to seek the way for, you know, I, where was I? You know, even like I um, uh, was talking with somebody the other day. Where, who was I even talking to? We're talking about the sports activities and just finding out afresh, wow, how many sporting activities happen on a Sunday morning for the next generation? And I've just been, you know, I think of somebody playing football and I was like, so when do they play? Oh, Sunday morning, peewee football, or this or that. I don't think that happens up here, because I think, Nate, you're doing it like weeknights or something like that. But in other, other places, and I'm like, oh, man, that's just, it's like a, it's robbery from the opportunity for you to go serve the Lord. you got to make that, that, that's a tough decision. But you're like, yeah, my son wants to play this, or my daughter wants to play this, and yeah, you got to wrestle through that. At the end of the day, though, what is the Lord telling you to do? And you better run with that after all your heart. That's what, that's what, the, what the Lord said to Manoah here. Again, we see that even in the life of Mary herself. God comes and speaks to Mary some pretty strong things. And he says this. He says, the Lord is with you, O highly favored one. There's a plan for your life. There's a purpose. Serve me. Follow after me. Run after me. Verse 15, reading on. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I'll not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that when your words come true, we may honor you? I love this. The angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask me? Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. They're, this is like, they're, they're talking with the Lord right here. This is like an obvious, this is like an amazing opportunity to meet with God. What? And so Manoah took the young goat. Excuse me, Sorry took the young goat in the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. Check it out. To the one who works wonders. Why do you, why do you ask me my name when you see it? That's wonderful, right? So then they turn and they offer, they offer this, this, uh, this offering to the one who works wonders. I want to just remind us all today. Boy, if we can get anything else, I just, this was as I was just preparing. This wasn't in my notes, but as I was preparing this this morning and just going over the verse again, that, this just leapt out of my heart. I am the God who works wonders. That's what he's telling us. I am the Lord who works wonders. We need some wonderful working of God. Amen? Let us not forget he is the one who works wonders. And this offering came before the wonder that they were hoping for. It, it did. She wasn't pregnant yet. This is not, there's... There, when this all comes true, what shall we, what's your name that we may, why do you ask my name, seeing that it's wonderful? And then they offer up this offering to the one who works wonders. All they had was a word, and they stood on that word in expectation for what God was going to do. They worshiped in wonder at how awesome he is. There are, there are words, there are things that God has spoken to you in the, from the word of God. God has challenged you and spoken things to you and the enemy would want nothing more but to steal that and rob that from your life. And I'm telling you today, you need to stand on the word of God in your life. Lord, I am your child. I am your, I am your daughter. I am your son. You have a plan for me. You have a purpose for me. You have a mission for me. I have not been abandoned. I have not been forgotten. I am not left alone. I am, I am yours. To the one who works wonders in Manoah and his wife were watching. And while the flame went up toward heaven... From the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell their faces on the ground. And the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. And then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands 
or shown us all these things, or now announced to us all such to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and she called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanandan between Zorah and Eshtal. Again, just the just the, the language here, just so similar to what we see in the, in, in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter one: She gave birth to his son. She called his name Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Why the comparisons? Why the similarities? What what is the win here? One of the wins that we need to understand is that the Old Testament is not some old, archaic piece of writing that we are just, you know, now that we got the New Testament, let's just throw the Old Testament out. There are people that even teach that. That, well, you know, the Old Testament, eh, you know, eh, really, we don't really need that. Let's, let's detach that. No, 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 no. The, the Old Testament is meant to be one with the New Testament. Those two books, they go hand in hand. You know why? Because there is opportunity after opportunity or story after story of God's redemption to a broken, drifting people. Even this story right here where there is nobody crying out to the Lord, not even, we don't even see it in the life of Manoah and his wife, and yet God visits them and sends a deliverer through them to a broken and drifting people. In the midst of these broken people, God raises up fallible men, men with frailties and weaknesses and flaws, and what does God do? He fills them with the Holy Spirit. God intervenes in his grace and his goodness for what purpose? To redeem to redeem in the moment, but also in the moment of redemption to say, there's a greater redeemer. I want to, I want to tell you about him. I'm going to show you the way to him. So that in the Old Testament, they're looking forward to the cross. They're looking forward to Jesus. Their stories of redemption, all, all like kind of, you know, they, they're, they're echoing something that's coming, right? The coming king. But guess what? Our stories, our lives right now, the, what God, the story God's writing in your life, your testimony, is a, is a reflection Of what happened, what the coming king came and who he is. So your life now gets to be an ongoing story of the redemption of God through the church, his people. This is awesome. This is like, this to me fires me up. I was reading an article a couple weeks ago. I I scan different uh, uh, newspapers and read read different things uh, online. It's the beautiful thing of online. Uh, But there was an article a couple weeks ago in the LA Times. I don't know if you saw this article. It, it, It just tremendously moved me. And, uh, it's a, it's a story of redemption, of a modern-day story of redemption. I want to read this to you uh, momentarily from the L.A. Times. It says, Nearly 29 years had passed when Trino Jimenez decided to write to the man who murdered his brother, prepared to never hear back. And I want to say this, too. This is like the L.A. Times. I, I love this, too, because it's not like this is coming from some, you know, uh, expected, like, source. Well, you know, where did you hear that article? This is like, you know, L.A. Times. I don't know. It just has this, this sense of, like, I wouldn't expect to read it here. So, so nearly 29 years had passed when Trino Jimenez decided to write to the man who murdered his brother, prepared to never hear back. The killing in South Los Angeles had been brutal. Melvin Carroll had struck Julio Jimenez repeatedly over the head with a bumper jack during a car theft. He walked away and then panicked, returning to slit Julio Jimenez's throat with a broken bottle. We have this story 29 years ago, Julio Jimenez, a man was, uh, you know... It was uh, his car stolen and then killed by this other man by the name of Mel- Melvin Carroll. And uh, I won't get into the details, but Trino Jimenez, Julio's brother, uh, went through a real dark time in his life. And uh, they get real quick here to the story of what happened to him. But Trino Jimenez, now this is 29 years later, a devout Christian. Let's love this, you know what I mean? A devout Christian was ready to forgive. He writes in his letter to, to, to Melvin, he says, I can never forget my brother. But I am not consumed about an event that can never be undone, he told Carol in his February 2015 letter. God loves you, and even the crime of murder is a forgivable offense. Unbelievable. Within a few weeks, he received a response back from Melvin Carroll, setting the stage for an unthinkable friendship. A little further in the article, it gives Melvin Carroll, now this guy in prison who's been there for, you know, 30 years, whatever, receiving this letter. So it says, at a prison in Vacaville, Carol recognized the last name on the letter and expected some hate mail. Instead, he could barely believe what it said. And this is what the letter, more of the letter. After this occurrence, I faced many struggles, Trino wrote. 
My heart was filled with anger, and not only in anger towards the people responsible, but towards an entire race. One of Trino, Trino Jimenez's uh, testimonies is that before he got saved, and after his brother was killed, he just he he hated uh, anybody that was black. He just absolutely hated them. And this is a story of God not only saving him, but forgiving an entire people. And so then he says here, Trino says, God had to help me with my struggles, with my anger. Eventually, he carved out this anger from me. I love this because this guy Trino is sharing his testimony with the one person in his life that you could say, boy, that guy was was the genesis of his pain and his anger and his frustration. And yet God is doing something miraculous. A friend told him him and has sounded sincere. So Carol sent him a typed response. He was overwhelmed that Jimenez had strong faith in God despite losing his brother and told him, this is what he told him back, through your letter, God has restored me. Jimenez's letter touched others as well. Carol told him that they had almost created a Bible study circle in his building as inmates tried to understand the scriptures that he sent, often on God's forgiveness of sin. As they corresponded, Carol said in an interview, he began to truly feel the pain he had caused the Jimenez family. And after so many years of hurting people, he said remorse just hadn't been part of his lifestyle. And he said, I started feeling it, and it hurt. It really hurt because I never thought about remorse. Never. All I thought about was the time I had to do. So they eventually met. And the article goes on. It says, after six hours of talking, the two men embraced Carol was later smiling so hard that he was asked if he had been found suitable for parole. Being forgiven for the hurt you caused the family, it took so much weight off my shoulders, like I was soaring on my way back to the cell. And so his inmate, other inmates asked, you were found suitable for parole. He said, man, I got something so much better than that. And it's a story of God taking some really terrible times and bringing amazing restoration to a real broken situation. God wants to redeem terrifically awful situations for his glory. Amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11 says, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desires in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. God is the redeemer. And you know what he raises up? He raises up a people that carry on that flag of redemption. That our God is the redeemer. And that you might be in a scorched place right now. You might be in a place of your life. You might feel like the land is scorched from the sin of the Philistines and there's nobody crying out and nothing's going on. And I'm telling you, God in his great goodness has sent forth the deliverer, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And in this moment, even in your life, you can be like a well-watered garden in the midst of a scorched land and say, God, you can do something awesome through my life and in my life. Every single opportunity in your life requires that, requ- that that's difficult. Or, you know, everyone is an opportunity for God to, to, to redeem something and be glorified in the midst of it. To see the kingdom of God established in a broken place. As we look at the life of Samson, there have been plenty of messages. Perhaps you've uh, heard plenty as well of just, you know, Samson was a womanizer. And he was a this thing. And he was a that thing. And, and certainly, I mean... There, there's, there's a lot of different things out there about Samson. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into some more of that next week of the perceived flaws in his character and his personality in his life. But if, what, if, if that's all we see in Samson or the story of Samson's life, I think we're missing something pretty outstanding. We're seeing not only somebody who's really a, a second Moses figure, a, a leader in the land that God raises up and fills with the Spirit of God for such a time as that. But somebody whose life is just a pale reflection of a coming king, an eternal king, an eternal warrior for the things of God. Somebody who's eternally strong and 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 who himself is the well-watered garden that comes to repair the breach even in our own souls to bring redemption to broken, dead areas. It's awesome. I don't have time to dive into chapter 14 today. I'm going to move on to chapter 15, but chapter 14 uh, deals with, you know, an unconsummated marriage to a Philistine woman, a riddle, a, you know, a battle, a victory at Ashkelon, how Samson's wife was given to another man. And it's like this, this uh, uh, study it, read it, talk about it in your small groups, uh, talk about it with me. Certainly there's uh, great things here. But the whole thing, it's just a reminder of through Samson's life that he comes even to his own 
wife and she's given to another man. It's just a, it's a, it's a real broken situation. Again, I believe just reflecting Jesus coming to his own and his own not receiving him. Clear picture of the day of how the, even the whole land lived as it related to God. Samson's marriage was abandoned as quickly as the people abandoned the Lord. Convenience and selfishness was king. And the land drifted and was being ravaged and worn out by the Philistines. But I want to close today on chapter 15. A familiar story that happened, but I want to talk a little bit about the setup. You see, Samson was taken by the men of Judah, and he was handed over to the Philistines. Why? Because he was causing trouble, and Judah was pretty comfortable in being run by the Philistines. They are pretty comfortable in having somebody else lord over them. And by the way, this is Judah. This is, this is, this is the, the lineage of David, the lineage of Jesus himself. And these people try to get rid of the problem, to get rid of Samson. And Samson was being used by God to bring judgment to the wickedness of the land, the wickedness of the Philistines, and the people wanted nothing to do with it. But even in the midst of this, God's redemption is, is at play. Because ultimately, this isn't the last we ever hear of the people of Judah. We obviously know who, who, who comes through Judah. But Judah's the one who ties Samson up. They're the one who tiles up, ties up Samson, and they say to the Philistines, you deal with the problem. In many ways, it's very familiar to me of, of, the, of Jesus being taken by the Sanhedrin and handed over to the Romans. You deal with this problem. You take care of this problem in front of us. In Judges 15, 14, we begin to read what happens. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. This is Samson. And check it out. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. Listen, everyone pictures, and I've done it too, everyone pictures Samson as this larger-than-life person, right? This, like this Hulk, this, you know, this Hulk of a person. The, the, Israel, the Israeli Tarzan, right? This guy is just the man. I mean, I'm not, I know there was a movie, Samson and Delilah, years ago. I don't even know who played the parts, but I think if they were to make a movie now of Samson, we, could, we would easily say, oh, man, it's probably got to be played by what? Like, you know, The Rock, right? He should play Samson, right? Or, or, uh, or Jason Momoa, another, another big, these guys that are larger than life creatures where you look at them and say, yeah, I get it. Look at that dude. He, look, how, look, how, look how big and how strong he is. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. As we read through the story of Samson in Scripture, they don't know where his strength comes from. People are wondering, where does your strength come from? If we saw some, some mammoth man do some amazing feats, we'd say, well, I, he's probably a pretty strong guy. We, I get where his strength comes from. He's, he's, he's superhuman, right? He's got, he's got this extra strength. Samson, they didn't know. Samson had moments of incredible strength and people were baffled. Where did his strength come from? Again, if he, had, if he had all the signs, people wouldn't have asked those questions. But I believe Samson was just a regular guy. That when the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, that guy did some business. That guy moved in some powerful ways. I think, I think actually in the book of Judges, Samson's the one who the Spirit of the Lord intervenes the most on his life. We see the Spirit of the Lord filled him, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. But like Jesus, there was nothing about Samson that would have drawn people to him. Actually, like I said, the people of Judah wanted to sell him off and get rid of him and remove him. Because why? Because man constantly looks to the outward appearance. Jesus was not, there's nothing to, to draw him to, to, he was just normal. I watched that, the, the, the show The Chosen, which I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, The Chosen. I mean, many of you, I've, I've told you that. But I, I, I remember what we watched it, and they're like, there's nothing special about him, but there's something so amazingly special about him. You know what I'm saying? We chat about that. It's just normal, supernatural. Natural, supernatural, right? It's, it's, it's this thing about Jesus. But even through the Bible, we see these guys constantly looking to the outward appearance and not to the heart. I mean, the very uh, uh, contemporary judge of, Samuel, of Samson is the judge named Samuel. They believe they, they were at the same time. These guys are existing in the same world. They, they're, they're on the earth at the same time. It's not like Samuel came later. These guys are actually walking the planet together in some fashion, Samson and Samuel. Pretty interesting. But Samuel, even when he goes to anoint Saul, do you know what the Bible says about Saul? He was a handsome man. Right? What else about him? He was heads and shoulders above everybody else. Saul walks in the room, and you're like, there he is. There's the king. 
There's the man. Guess what? It was a failure. It was a failure. Saul had something really off in his own heart. So God raises up. So God says to Samuel, I love it if you read the scripture. It's like Samuel's farewell address. You know, like the scripture does that in 1 Samuel. But then it moves on. It's like, well, Samuel still had a lot more work he had to do yet. He thought he was done with Saul, but God said, no, there's more to do. And so then he goes to the house of Jesse and he, oh, it's got to be this one. Look at this guy, you know, okay. It's got to be this guy. It's got to be this guy. And God says to him, Samuel, man looks on the outward. I look at the heart. So at the end of it, he says, is there anybody else? And of course, David out in the field, the forgotten son, would become the anointed one. But again, this whole story, as we read through Judges, it's a continual story of God taking the forgotten, the common, the weak, and making them uncommon. Making them strong. Making them fulfill his purpose in an awesome way. So the, 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 the flax, the, uh, the, the, um, the ropes become melted like flax and they just drop to the ground. Verse 15, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and he put out his hand and he took it and with it he struck down a thousand men. A fresh jawbone. Not a brittle old one, right? A fresh jawbone. That's what it is. And God brings a mighty victory through a jawbone. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey have I struck down a thousand men. And as soon as, he had fin- as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramoth Lehi. And again, there's so much study we could dive into. There really is. Uh, the names and, and, and what they're called and, and uh, why they're called what they're called. It's, uh, and I just encourage you to, to reach into that stuff. But for us today, as we wrap up, What's in your hand? What's in your life? What is laying around you today? What seems seemingly insignificant around you today that God wants to use for his glory, for his purpose? In many ways, we are the insignificant ones. We are the ones laying around the hands of God. In many ways, we are the ones that God takes and uses for his glory. And in many ways, Samson taking that jawbone is exactly how God took Samson in his hand and wrought out a victory in his own life in that that day. So I want to bring three quick applications to this for us today. Number one, what can you recount of the miracles of God in your life, the wonders of God? Samson had a miraculous birth. He was a grace gift to the people of Israel, something that stuck with him through his life. Your life is probably riddled with miracles. Remember them. Write them down. (laughs) Recall them. Remind yourself about them. Chapters of the Word of our Bible, are written with stories of miraculous births. That's exciting to me. Some of you guys in this room have miraculous birth stories. You have miraculous stories that God intervened in the birth of your children, and that is something to be celebrated, remembered, recalled, and recounted, and shared with people. If you got a miraculous birth story, you are in great company today. That's good news. So recount the good things of God where God's worked wonders because that is something that can encourage you and fill you even in the moments when you're looking for God to do something fresh. Number two, be where your feet are. We didn't dive into chapter 14 too much. It's an interesting chapter. But one big takeaway for us is that God uses Samson to bring judgment to the Philistines. And God's victory was to be found in the life of Samson. As Samson went, God went with him. As he, as he walked with him, God brought victory. God had purposes. Where are your feet today? Where is the area where your feet are standing? And what is the victory that God is looking to bring in your life there? God wants to accomplish something through your life. What parts of your life right now can be used as a redemptive story unto God? What part of your life right now does God want to redeem and God want to bring victory in? Maybe where there's defeat. And finally, number three, what's in your vicinity, in your circle of your life that maybe looks worthless to you? Maybe it's a dead donkey head, right? It's like, that, that, ain't ha- that doesn't have much purpose there. I don't even know where he was. Like, I, don't, I mean, it's just kind of an odd thing. Like, I don't know where donkeys just stop and die. I don't even know how that even works. <laughs> I really, I don't know. But there it is. There's a jawbone of a pretty fresh donkey, and he picks it up when there's a battle needed. We look at it, we say that donkey bone, that, 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 that's insignificant. Yeah, well, so wasn't Shamgar's ox goat. So wasn't David's five smooth stones. There are things that God puts in our hand so he can get the glory in, our, in, our, in and through our lives. 
I wrote down some things. Maybe there's an idea God dropped in your heart that you had forgotten about. Maybe a relationship in your life is broken and tattered. Maybe there's a prophetic word that God gave you and you've neglected it. You've laid it down. Maybe the Bible itself needs to be freshly picked up, dusted off, and read and taken in the word of God. Maybe there's, some, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's an idea in your heart, a poem to write or a book to write or a phone call to make or a visit you've been putting off or a letter you think would be a waste of time. I don't know. But we look at those things as seemingly, man, it's not really, I mean, some of them are more significant than others, but some of them are like, yeah, I don't really know. What, what's the real purpose of that? But if something's beating in your heart, if something's like saying there, then, then don't devalue something because you feel like it's not a big deal. God wants to bring some victory through something. Step out in those areas. And then when you step out in those areas, don't overvalue that thing. Like somehow it's, it's more, it's like, you know, I finally, uh, you know, finally made that phone call. And, uh, and therefore, the next thing may be a letter. The next thing might be, uh, who knows where, how God wants to bring victory in your life. And I'm just trying to think of silly ideas that, not, not silly, excuse me, what seems to be insignificant. But I just don't want you to, I want you to move and take what's around you and see God bring some life to it. And see God bring some strength to it. And see God bring some victory to it, whatever it might be. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life. At the end of the day, it's God who gets the glory. He gets the glory through Samson's life. It's not the weak that get the glory. It's the one who's eternally strong that gets all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. Let's stand to our feet. God said to Mo Moses, it's interesting, just God said to Moses, what's in your hand? And what did he have? He had a shepherd's staff. And I think that's something we see through the whole Old Testament. What's in your hand? I don't know what's, what's in your hand. I don't, I don't know what tools God has put in your life. But I believe God wants to, to show you what's in your hand, to give you strength in what's in your hand, to give you strength for the place where you are, to be where your feet are. If you're sitting in the middle of a, of a valley right now and there's a jawbone next to you and a thousand Philistines coming against you and you feel like, Defeat is upon me. I'm going to tell you, no, I think God wants a different story to be written right now. Pick up that insignificant jawbone and see God bring victory to an area that you're expecting defeat in. God wants to bring victory in an area. Maybe it's your family or a, be like, well, man, I didn't want to be in this, in this situation. A couple weeks ago, we prayed over broken families and estranged. Man, that's been on my heart. We've been praying for that. And we had different people raise their hands or stand up and we prayed for one another. I've already been hearing miracles of God restoring some broken relationships. That's like really exciting. There's miracles happening of God doing those things. Where, what is it? It's God taking the jawbones of our life and bringing victory in amazing ways. He's taking that which seems dead, that which seems like, and bringing life through it and victory through it. His own very, his own very life. You know, Bible says... God, you know, um, uh, you know, was victorious. I'm, I'm, I'm missing. I'm getting like about 84 scriptures in my mind right now, messed up. Uh, but the, uh, you know, he he brings he he uh, he shamed the he shamed the what seemed to be wise in the world, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. The cross seems foolish. That's it. The cross is foolishness. It's just a jawbone. But in the hands of the King, it's life for us forevermore. Amen? Amen? So Father, today, Lord, wherever we may be and wherever we may be standing in our life, we're weak, but you're strong. Lord, we may be in a situation that we, it's like, how did I end up here? But Lord, for your glory, you can not only uh, deliver us out of that maybe broken situation, but you can bring glory in the midst of that situation. You can be honored and glorified. And Lord, the gospel can go forth and the kingdom of God can be established in a place where maybe uh, that we've been overrun. I pray for those people today that are overrun, where the Philistines have gotten so far in and encamped so much in their life, their thinking right now is like the Judah, Judah's thinking there. It's broken. It's like, I don't know if I want to deliver her here. It's, it's too much work. But Lord, it's you who do the work. You're the one who brings the work. You're the one who brings the victory. Lord, help us to be delivered of that thinking. Lord, that says it's too much work to be, to be free. I, it's the same thing that the people in Israel, when they were under Egyptian rule, they struggled with as well. They t they, they, it's like they, they, people, we, get, we get satisfied in being broken. Lord, I pray that we would not be satisfied, Lord, with the broken, the broken garbage of the world, but Lord, our hearts today would just be on fire for you, Lord, longing for deliverance in areas where 
where we're seemingly overthrown. Lord, you are the victorious one. Help us today, we pray. Lead us today, we pray. Lord, equip us today, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen, amen. Amen. Let the, let the Lord be worshipped and honored through your lips and everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, may you just go with the grace and goodness of the Lord. God bless you. If you need prayer today um, for, any, for anything specific, come and let me know. We'll be happy to pray with you here at the front. God bless you.